Welcome to Geography 485 585L Internet Mapping, Module 5.2 Developing and Hosting OGC Services, OGC Services and Styling in GeoServer, Part 1. This week we will be focusing on an introduction to the concept of styled layer descriptors as they've been defined by the Open Geospatial Consortium and their implementation within GeoServer with a number of illustrations of the creation of styles within GeoServer with then demonstrations of the GeoServer style management capabilities and also style development capabilities in Quantum GIS as a supplement later in the week. Starting with the Open Geospatial Consortium Styled Layer Descriptor, or SLD standard, we can begin to understand how you can customize the display of your maps that are published through the services made available by GeoServer. When we're talking about styled layer descriptors, we can then refer to the standard that has been developed by the Open Geospatial Consortium um, in terms of symbolization that is both available um, in OGC services for configuration on the server side and in some instances the styled layer descriptors or styles may actually be provided by users as well depending on the configuration of a particular server. One thing to keep in mind is that while GeoServer implements the OGC SLD standard, not all of the standard has been implemented. Though fortunately, the areas where that implementation is not complete are fairly well identified within the documentation for GeoServer. In the case of this presentation, I'm basing uh, many of the examples upon the styled layer descriptor reference that is actually included as a part of the HTML documentation for the current release of GeoServer, um, particularly focusing on um, the GeoServer styled layer descriptor cookbook that is uh, linked from that documentation. When we're working with styles, we first must think about what the definition of styles are. In particular, in the case of styled layer descriptors, styles are defined as XML documents that conform to the OGC standard. And they consist of four major components. First, and probably the most frequently used components, are the symbolizers themselves that actually define how different types of data or contents within a service should be rendered. Those symbolizers include um, basically methods for uh, depicting points, lines, and polygons, for depict, uh, displaying rasters in a variety of ways, and also for rendering text within um, map products that are delivered by the services. Additionally, in a, on top of the symbolizers, you also have uh, styles that relate to labels in terms of defining how labels should be placed within generated map products. Filters that allow you to actually define multiple symbolizers, each of which define, uh, relate to a defined subset of features based on a set of conditions that are defined through the filter support. And finally, the ability to in integrate scale elements into the definition of styles and symbolizers so that you can even modify the symbolizers that are applied in a given map depending upon the map scale for which that map is being requested. In all cases, since we are talking about XML documents that represent styles, as we've seen previously, you have a fairly standard block of XML header information 
that is provided as the standard content for the XML style documents that we're working with. This is an illustration of what that header content looks like where you can see it has the definition of the particular XML version, the variety of namespaces that the, that the standard is based upon, and then, of course, the styled layer descriptor root element, which then contains one or more named layer elements, each of which are essentially the definitions of our specific styles. In the examples that are provided in the lecture, we will focus on these named layer elements and their contents, taking the containing root document and header information as given so that we can concentrate more on the named layer structure and content. But don't forget when you're developing your own styled layer descriptors that you need a complete and valid XML document that includes the namespaces that are used and the XML specification and the root styled layer descriptor element. This is a sample styled layer descriptor file uh, in, it, in its totality. So this does include the um, header and named layer element, but this will be the last time we actually see on the, as a part of the lecture, a full document. We're otherwise gonna be focusing on subsections of the document that are relevant to us. So you can see we have the header information and then we have this named layer area here. where within that we're defining the name of this particular layer. We're then defining a user style, which is essentially the container for a specific style definition. We have a title for that style. And then we start to actually get into the style itself where we're defining the feature type style and then any number of rules in, within that, where in this case we're defining a point symbolizer that consists of a graphic element that in turn uh, is based upon a well-known named mark type, in this case a circle, with a fill parameter set to this color and also a particular size. So this is an illustration of what a complete styled layer descriptor document can be look like, can, 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 looks like, in this case, defining a very basic style that consists of a filled circle that's six pixels in diameter. This is what that style looks like when it is actually applied to a specific data set consisting of point features. So you can see on the right how those individual um, point styles are rendered as a part of a map representation of a very simple point geometry. Here we see an alternative uh, style, in this case, using the line symbolizer, as you can see here, where for the line symbolizer, we're described, we're de defining a stroke and some characteristics of that stroke, which in this case is the color of the stroke, black, and the width of the stroke, three pixels as these are options that, are, that can be used in defining a line symbolizer and the representation of lines within a uh, vector data set. Here we have a polygon style, again, very basic, where essentially in this case, we have a polygon symbolizer that we're defining which in this case has a single fill element where we are specifically defining the color of the fill for the polygons. And you can see on the right hand side what those filled polygons look like in this very simple style. 
In all of these previous three cases, if you would like to look at the full styled layer descriptor document, you can follow the links included in the slides and the lecture notes. Styles are not limited to vector data. You can also define styles for raster data, where you can actually do some fairly sophisticated um, visualization of raster data through the definition of essentially color maps and other characteristics of how you want to define the mapping between raster values and uh, particular colors and how those colors should be calculated or used. And we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. But in this case, we have our rule that is essentially uh, consisting of a raster symbolizer and then any of the styles associated with that raster. Let's go back now to the basic structural requirements for the different symbolizers, starting with the point symbolizer that you can see here. So when you're talking about a point symbolizer, you essentially have a graphic element, and I've excluded the closing tags for all of the elements here for simplicity. But in all cases, you are going to need to have both an opening and a closing tag for each one of these elements. But for simplicity's sake, the closing tags have been eliminated from this, these particular examples. When you're defining a point symbolizer, you first start with a graphic element. Within that graphic element, you can then define one of two different types of symbolizers for point locations. One external graphic uses an external graphic file. So you might think of a graphic file that has a picture of a triangle or a picture of a wellhead, or maybe a picture of um, a, a cow. And in any of, any of those instances, what you're essentially doing is pointing to a web accessible image that you want to use to symbolize each one of the individual points in that particular um, rule. As an alternative, you can choose basic geometric marks, all of which are named. And then so you would you would be required in that case to provide a well known name, basically one of the defined names. And then you can optionally define some additional characteristics for that mark in terms of, you know, what fill color, what stroke may may be applied to that any opacity size and rotation to that mark. So those are all options that you can apply with the fundamental principle being that you can for point markers either refer to an external graphic or a well-defined um, geometric mark that has some additional uh, optional display characteristics. As we move on to a, the line symbolizer you start with the definition of a stroke. Within that, you then can define some additional characteristics in terms of whether or not it might actually have a fill characteristic for the line, where in that case you would provide a graphic element that has the exact same content as the previously defined point symbolizer. You might also have a graphic stroke option, which controls the essentially the line itself. In this case, again, that would be required to contain a, at least one graphic element that is also the same as we just discussed for the point symbolizer. In either case, what you're doing is with the graphic fill, you are defining a series of graphic elements as, as they correspond to points along the line that would be displayed along the stroke. You can separately define the stroke itself 
using uh, similar uh, characteristics at, as defined in the point symbolizer. You also have the option of setting some additional what are called CSS parameters for more detailed control, particularly of the stroke characteristics for a line symbolizer. When we come to polygon symbolizers, as with the uh, line symbolizer, we are building on the previous definitions. So for a polygon, in this case, we can define the graphic fill for that polygon, where we can essentially define using the same specification as the point symbolizer, either a set of web accessible images that would essentially be used to fill the polygon or geometric shapes that could also be used to fill the polygon. You also can specify the stroke, which is the bounding line for each polygon feature, where those strokes are based upon the same symbolization vocabulary and structure as you use for the line symbolizer. Finally, you also can apply and define CSS parameters for your polygon symbolizer, specifically addressing the fill and the opacity of the fill for that polygon. Finally, we can talk about the raster symbolizer, which is conceptually a very different uh, symbolization process. Where in, a in, in any of the vector symbolizers, you're essentially defining visualization or representation for individual features within that vector data set. For the raster symbolizer, we instead focus on essentially rules that define how individual pixels in that raster should be displayed. And this is also a symbolizer where we see an instance where not all of the Open Geospatial Consortium SLD um, capabilities have been implemented. In particular, the shaded relief, overlap behavior, and image outline elements are not currently implemented by GeoServer. That having been said, we still have some very powerful uh, methods for being able to uh, modify and design our representation of raster data. Starting with the ability to define the opacity of the raster as a whole. So you can even um, define the, uh, the, you know, the, how the raster might actually be able to overlay onto other layers by specifying the opacity of the entire raster symbolizer. Within the symbolizer, you then can create one or more color map elements, where each one of those, uh, or you can also then create for each raster a color map which may then contain multiple color map entries, each of which define a particular color and value and label and potentially opacity for pixels that meet the, uh, the definition of those color map entries. A color map may be of three different types, either a ramp where the values are essentially interpolated smoothly between the individual color map entries. So you may be able to define a color map that only consists of two entries, the low value for the raster values and the high value for the raster values. With a ramp type of color map, you would then get a continuous gradient between those two colors for all intermediate values. Any raster values that fall below the lowest value would be assigned the color for the lowest value. Any raster values that are larger than the highest color map 
quantity value would be assigned the highest color, the, the color that corresponds to the highest value. Others would then be assigned their interpolated values. An alternative color map type is one where you actually are specifying individual values and only those values that will be displayed as a part of the raster. That is the values type where you actually, in that case, specify only the values that would be displayed with the other values in the raster if they are not on essentially that list of color map entries not being shown at all. So for a values type of color map, you may uh, effectively use that possibly for a nominal raster, say that has a vegetation classification or other, other uh, sort of classification data that is presented in a raster form. The third type of color map is an intervals color map where you actually define points along a range of values and those, those points are, de are defining the start and end point of intervals for wi uh, to which individual fixed colors will be applied. So this is in contrast to the interpolation of colors that the ramp does with an intervals uh, type, only fixed colors are applied for the uh, r raster pixels that have that are within the range from the lowest value to the next to just below the next highest value. Also, as a part of the definition of the color map, you can define whether or not it essentially is using an extended color palette or color range where true uses a palette of over 16,000 potential colors that could be used, say, for example, in the interpolation of the color ramp. False uses a simplified color ramp of only 255 colors, potentially making your image smaller in size and more efficient to transfer over the web. Depending on the nature of your data, you may decide that that simplified color palette or that more complex color palette is going to serve you best in your representation. Each color map entry has a corresponding color that you define, a value or quantity that corresponds to a value in the raster itself, a label that you can apply, and also an opacity that you can apply. So you can actually, at the level of an individual color within the raster, define the opacity or you know transparency of those individual pixels. That's a very powerful capability. With the raster symbolizer, you can also handle um, multi-channel raster data and specifically define which of those channels would be applied to the red, green, and blue channels in terms of basically building a color image or pseudo color image from any uh, specified bands or a combination of specified bands um, in the source data. You can alternatively specify a single grayscale channel that you would then provide the, the name of the channel um, to define which, which channel should be used for that gray, gray channel instead of an RGB representation or red, green, and blue color representation. You also have the option within the raster symbolizer of doing very basic contrast enhancement. So there are algorithms that can be applied that will actually um, improve the uh, range of values that are represented by your raster image, your image representing your raster, by applying one of the contrast enhancement um, options as a part of the definition of the raster symbolizer. This is a very uh, flexible and powerful way of defining how you want to render raster data. Let's move on now to filters, as filters are another key component in the definition of vector styles. 
when we're talking about filters, we're, we have a number of options when defining those filters. We can define filters based on attribute values. So we can define a particular named attribute and then, def and then specify whether or not that attribute is equal to, not equal to, less than or greater than or any of these other options that are shown here. You can then combine those basic filter conditions with additional logical filters so you can build them up into uh, combined statements using these and, or, or not um, logical filters at, as an augmentation to the basic comparisons that you can use based on attribute values. You also can apply spatial filters. So you can define essentially comparisons for feature geometries against another specification to determine whether or not those geometries actually intersect or equal or overlap or other spatial comparisons to a provided geometry. This is a way of essentially defining which features should be um, uh, included in a particular style based on their location. Finally, you can also define uh, styles and essentially uh, filters based on scale. So you can define maximum and minimum scale denominators that can be used to determine whether or not a particular style is going to be applied based on the context of essentially the map image that is being requested. If that map image falls within the range or values defined by the minimum and maximum scale denominators optionally included in a style definition, that style will or won't be applied depending upon the scale of the map that's requested. When we're talking about attribute filters, there's some information that you need to know that is critical for being able to actually have the filters properly applied. And the key is the attribute name and the values for that field that are going to be used. Those are key things that you have to build into an attribute filter to have it effectively operate. So the attribute names can be determined using a number of methods. One is through GeoServer itself. As, as we have seen through the um, layer interface, when you lo are looking at the information for a, a particular store of data within GeoServer, one of the pieces of information that you can see is the list of attributes and their data types. You may also be able to look, obtain the attribute names and information about their data from any metadata or documentation published for those data sets. Finally, you can use the OGR info command um, on the file system to also obtain a list of the field names and information about those fields. In any case, you must know the name of the attributes, the name of the fields that you're going to be using in that attribute filter specification. Here is an example that is uh, applying a set of attribute filters to roads in the state of New Mexico with the link on this page providing access to the full style, style layer descriptor applied to this map and the following slides illustrating the individual components of this styled layer descriptor. The thing to note here is that we actually have three separate road types being displayed. We have the interstates, 
with the black with yellow marks on them. We have the U.S. highways, which are the red, um, red roads. And then we have the more local highways in the gray. So we actually, in this case, have three separate style descriptions with filters at, uh, associated with them so that we can differentially apply the styles that we see in this example to the different types of roads. Starting with the New Mexico highways, we're defining a rule and within that we're defining a title for the rule, in this case NM highways. We're defining a filter as the, as the next item in our styled layer descriptor, where in this case, we are doing a comparison where we're saying we want to test whether the, a particular property is equal to a specified value. We're defining the property name as type, as you can see within that property name element. And we're defining what it's being compared to using that literal element, which has a value of state highway. This filter condition compares for every feature in the data set that this style is being applied to. It looks for a type property and then we'll compare the value in that type property to this literal value that we've provided state highway. If that type for that feature is equal to state highway, this line symbolizer will then be applied to it. If it does not equal state highway, this line symbolizer will not be applied and that particular feature will not be displayed as a result of this specific rule. The line symbolizer then defines the stroke and the characteristics of the stroke in terms of color and width. And that is the entire definition of this particular rule that is a combination of a filter and a line symbolizer. We can move on to a second rule that we've entitled U.S. highways that also has a filter condition consisting of another property is equal to comparison, where in this case property name is again type as the type field contains essentially the multiple types within uh, a, a road database. And we're now comparing the type to U.S. highway instead of New, Mex New Mexico Highway. So that's our literal value that the value of the type property is going to be compared to. Those features for which the type property is US Highway will then have this line symbolizer applied to them. And in this case, we, we include two line symbolizers. This is a technique you can use for actually building up a symbol based on multiple components. So you might recall that in the case of the US highways, it was actually something that looked like a, uh, a, a, a highway edges with a color in the middle. That is essentially created by using two line symbolizers, one that is three pixels wide for the stroke width and one that is one pixel wide for the stroke width. As those are overlaid on top of each other, it creates the effect of a line that, is, that consists of two parallel lines with a fill color. The key thing to remember here is that these line symbolizers are only going to be applied to those features that match the filter condition that is defined above. Finally, we have our interstate highways, which is an additional rule, remembering that all of these rules are within a single style, a single styled layer descriptor file, 
where in this case the title of our rule is interstates. We have another filter condition, again comparing the type property to a literal value, in this case interstate. How do we know that interstate is a value that we want to be comparing? This is where knowledge about the underlying data um, is key. So being able to look at the table, being able to look at the information through OGR info is key because you can't just have a generic style that is smart enough to understand the various values that are in a data set. You have to code those values into your filter. And you, then it's only appropriate to use that filter and that style for data that match the filter conditions you're using. Here again, we're comparing the type property to the value interstate and applying this pair of line symbolizers to those, those features that meet that filter condition. In this case, we have a five pixel wide line that is overlain by a three pixel wide line. Again, giving us that effect of essentially parallel lines with a color fill. As I mentioned earlier, attribute filters are not the only filters that you can apply. You can also apply scale factors through the use of a max scale denominator and min scale denominator element within a rule. You can use these in conjunction with other filter conditions or you can use them um, just in, in, in combination with a particular symbolizer. In this example, we're going to be adding scale factors to our existing New Mexico, US, and interstate highways um, styles as an illustration of the effect of these uh, scale factors and filters. Here is an example of the same data that have now had a style that includes both a um, filter and the application of a style based on that filter to the for the interstates that we're seeing here, where we're seeing this at a scale of one to nine million, we are only seeing the interstates as we had previously defined a style for them. As we zoom in through the map client, we're now at a factor, a scale factor of one to two million, and we can now see that the U.S. highways have shown up, where at the um, at the smaller scale they had not yet appeared. And finally, at a scale of one to five hundred eighty-six thousand, we now see all three of our feature types are, are styled um, uh, features, the interstate highways, the New Mexico highways, and the U.S. highways. How, what does this look like in the context of the styled layer descriptors that we had defined previously? We have the core rules that we had defined earlier with only one additional element. And that is the introduction of, in this case, a max scale denominator of 1 million for the New Mexico highways. Meaning that the New Mexico highways will not be displayed unless the map scale is less than 1 to 1 million. You see that in the max scale denominator element here towards the middle of the rule that we have on the screen. In comparison, the U.S. highways have the exact same styled layer descriptor rule with the exception of now the addition of a max scale denominator element with a value of 5 million. 
with that then determining when that those US highways are going to be displayed. We finally get to our interstate highways, where in this case, the rule defined for the interstate highways is exactly the same as the one that we looked at previously, and that we're not applying any additional style limits or scale limits to the display of the interstate highways. This has provided a very quick overview of some of the basic principles of what options you have when creating styled layer descriptors and, and how they then impact how the map images that are generated by GeoServer are generated and what they appear to be, what they appear like. We will later in the week actually demonstrate the process within GeoServer of editing styles, creating new styles, and applying styles to specific layers as a part of the process of configuring layers in GeoServer. We will also do a demonstration um, within Quantum GIS using QGIS's uh, styling options for vector data to actually be able to create styled layer descriptors that you can then import into GeoServer for application to layers within GeoServer.